Okay, so I'm hoping to explain a little bit about what we've done with 5050 and some of the thinking behind it. But I thought I would start off by talking about motivation because one of the things that it struck me three, four years ago when I started thinking about creating 5050 was that quite often in newsrooms we'd jump to the point where we accepted that representing women fairly in our journalism was a good idea, but we didn't often talk about why we thought it was a good idea. We talked about the how, but we didn't often speak openly about our motivation. And I don't know about you, but my experience is most of the time in my life, the things that I achieve that I would really like to achieve are largely the ones where I've really connected with the reasons for why I would like to achieve that. And so before getting into the practical side of this, I just wanted to talk about a few moments of the distant past, which have really shaped my thinking in terms of why this matters. The first goes right the way back to my teens. When I was around 16, 17, my mum gave me a copy of The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. And it coincided with one of my best friends becoming very ill with anorexia. And these two things were kind of happening at the same time. And I became increasingly confused why my best friend, who was a young woman, was getting poorly and why more women seemed to be experiencing anorexia than, than men. And I was reading Naomi Wolf and she was pointing out all of these things which I hadn't really thought about. And, you know, looking back on it from some distance, I don't necessarily agree with every point that Naomi Wolf makes in The Beauty Myth and the conclusions I was drawing around anorexia are definitely not necessarily the correct ones. But the broader point was that I was having my eyes open to the role that gender was playing in the experiences we all have in society. And my eyes to lesser or greater extents, have stayed open ever since. The second thing I'd highlight would be right at the end of my time at school. I had to sit an extra history exam in order to get into my university of choice. And I was the only person doing this exam, so I went to sit in a tiny room at my school. The teacher went, here you go, here's the three-hour paper, three essays, on you go. And one of the questions was, is democratisation inevitable? And I spent an hour writing page after page about why I thought it was. As an 18-year-old in the early 90s, I was very much a product of the optimism that came out of the post-war settlement. I had experienced uh, democratization going from country to country. And generally, I had an optimistic view that the world was heading in the right direction and that the only thing really standing in the way of us achieving the things that we thought were a good idea, whether it was equality or democracy, was time. Now, all those years on, I've rather changed my position. I don't necessarily think these things are inevitable, and I'm interested in more interventionist approaches to deliver the things that we believe are desirable. And we'll talk about the, na the nature of the intervention, but the idea of intervening was much more attractive to me as someone in their early 40s as it was to someone who was 18 at the time. The next thing I would fast forward to was when I was at university studying history and my director of studies was a leading social historian of early modern England. And he emphasized to all of us who came under his wings that if you're really to understand any period in history, you can't just look at it through politics or through the constitution or through the economy. You need to look at it through the social experience of people living at that time to fully understand it. He didn't say you only look at the social experience, but he said you need to look at the social experience. This had a huge impact on me. It emphasized that to really understand an event, whether it's 500 years ago or last week, you need to look at it through a diversity of perspectives and through a diversity of sources. And that idea really stayed with me. And actually, throughout my degree, I did a range of interesting things around the experience of women in early modern England. I also wrote a dissertation on gender, body, and mood gender, body, and food in late medieval European mysticism. So if you want to talk about uh, what was happening in the 14th century and recreating the suffering of Christ using food, I can help you with that. Um, but I'm not going to give you many more details now. But that idea uh, really stuck with me. And the fourth thing I would mention is just after I arrived at the BBC as a junior reporter in my mid-late 20s, uh, the programme I was working on had a lot of people who would always appear each week. They would come round. They had you know, fixed, fixed appearances. And about 70 to 80% of them were men. And I was seeing this and noticing this and was thought, you know, maybe this isn't so great. And I emailed the editor and I didn't get a reply. And the next time I saw him, I said, hey, did you see my email? And he went, I did, and I didn't like the tone. <laughs> and he's a nice guy and I'm still in touch with him, so I'm not being rude about him. But what stayed with me there was that if you're gonna try and make progress on this, simply pointing it out is not gonna be enough. You need to think very carefully about the language that you use, about how you go about getting people on side. 
Otherwise you end up being what I was, which was angry, sitting at my desk and not making much progress. So those four things have all in different ways informed my approach to what I've done. And what we've done, as a group of us now, is created a project called 5050. And at its heart was an idea that I've been fascinated with for a long time, which is, why is it that sometimes we'll say we all want something and yet it doesn't happen? Why is it that you'll have some ideas where there's no discussion about the desirability of this thing happening, but it doesn't happen? And the more I thought about it, the more I came back to this phrase, which popped into my head one day on the bus, a constant state of trying. And what I mean by this is where you accept a goal, but you also accept that it's not possible. And so long as you're trying to get towards that goal, whether you actually reach it or not becomes entirely secondary. It's not born out of any insincerity. It's not born out of a manipulation of the situation. It's just something that can happen to individuals, I can relate to it, and to organizations as well. So I started to think, how can I break us out of this constant state of trying, where as an organization, the BBC says, we want to fairly represent women in our content, and yet, as a presenter, I'm aware that my program doesn't do it and lots of other programs don't do it. So I started to think really hard in 2016 about what could I do. And I turned back to a model that I've used to try and get other things off the ground in my career. And it revolves around four types of people. So when I'm looking at ideas or goals, I'm thinking, who can inspire me? Who can help me think about doing this in a creative way? I'm thinking about who can I run these ideas by who's going to give me robust and helpful criticism? I invariably can't do half the things that I think of to do, so I need to get people who actually make and do things to help me run pilots or to come up with prototypes. And then in the end, I also have to think about who has the power to help me deliver this, because if you want to deliver something in a big organization, you don't necessarily go to the top. That person at the top, even if they're interested, has a hundred other fish to fry. You need to think about who are the people with direct power to help me deliver this thing exactly. And I knew that this kind of approach worked, because a few years ago I pitched my program Outside Source and to my delight the BBC decided to commission it and I went through a similar process of dealing with those four groups of people. So in the case of 50-50, 2016, I'm thinking about what can I do about this? What can inspire me to, to try and take action on this? Well one thing that's been inspiring me for a long time is the Everyday Sexism Project and what I loved about this project when it came along was it was documenting what was in plain sight. It was simply women saying this is happening now and documenting it and the simplicity of that was also its power and it resonated with, with me from the moment I saw it. In fact it was one of the inspirations to make a documentary five years ago called All That Stands in the Way. This is a documentary about four teenage girls in Lesotho, Jordan, Iceland and Catford who we documented and we observed and the idea of the documentary was if everyone says we believe in gender equality, if almost every country in the world has laws that demand gender equality, how come it's not happening? And my theory was it's not happening because we're all contributing to it in the social exchanges we have in our day-to-day -day lives. And this documentary is about documenting that. Everyday sexism does that in a different way. The next bit of inspiration came from a drive home to Cornwall. I'm from a small village in Cornwall. I drive home to see mum and dad a lot. I'm driving down the M5, the M4, this is the A38, all the way home, and I'm listening to a very well-known BBC radio news programme, and I'm thinking, they're going to have a woman on at some point, right? And I'm like, half an hour in, no, 45 minutes, no, all right, we're getting to the end of the programme, and there hasn't been a woman. And what had me with steam coming out of my ears wasn't the fact that it had occurred. When you're making programmes, things don't go to plan. Certain days can be really difficult. We all have times when programmes don't work out. What had steam coming out of my ears was I was pretty sure there wouldn't be a big fallout from this. If that same program had done a Duff interview, if that same program had broadcast a factually incorrect report, if that same program had produced an item that wasn't to the normal production standards we'd expect, my goodness, there'd be a huge debrief about why that had happened. So as I sat in the car, I thought, how can I sensitise us all so when we don't get this right, it hurts, in the way that when we don't get other things right, it hurts. There were two other bits of inspiration I'd mention. Uh, in late 2016, I visited X, which is a Google company. They call it the Moonshot Factory. I was less interested in moonshots. I was much more interested in how they use data. Data is pervasive there. They assess their progress towards whichever projects they're running and whichever goals they're using with data. They don't guess how they're doing. 
They know how they're doing, and it had a huge impact. The data was everywhere. You could see it shaping their culture. On that same trip, I also visited the D School, the design school at Stanford. This fantastic academic called Justin Farrell, who's worked at the Washington Post and other places, talked to us for an hour, and I just sat there kind of gripped about the power of small teams to change big organizations. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, on my program, there's about five or six of us. So if he's saying five or six works, then, then why not? And that had a huge impact. So when I got on the plane from San Francisco, I sat down with my G&T before dinner, and I wrote, started writing what would become the 50-50 project. And I wrote down the things that I wanted to achieve, but crucially, I also wrote down every single reason I could think of why my colleagues might say no. <laughs> because, quite rightly, journalists are skeptical, they're busy, they're not necessarily just going to jump because you say jump. They shouldn't jump when you say jump. So I had to think about, well, how do I make the case to them in a way that removes the reason to say no? And so I made a long list, and this is an abridged version of it. The first problem was we couldn't have a conversation about women's representation in our journalism because we had almost no data. You could say we're doing terribly. You could say we're doing badly. You couldn't have a proper conversation about it because no one knew. And there was a huge risk of a false narrative, that we're making progress. And I was presenting thinking, I don't know if we are making as much progress as we're telling ourselves. But if we are, let's find out. So we needed data. But crucially, almost every diversity project I'd seen so far, someone else was generating the data. This was going to be self-monitoring. So you have the double benefit of generating the data, but the people who are making the stuff are exposed to the data as they generate it. My theory being, if they saw the numbers, they would care more, they'd be more motivated, they'd have a clearer sense of where they were. But for data to work, for data to influence behavior, it's got to be seen as being fair. The moment anyone, a journalist or anyone else, feels that data that's to do with them is not fair, they disengage with it because they think, well, this is not accurate. They don't get a reaction, they dismiss it. So to make it fair, we put a couple of place, things in place. I was going to make it monthly, so that the ebb and flow of stories and guest availabilities, well, on any given day, we're not saying reach 50%. Across a month, we feel like that's reasonable. And we're going to discount the people the BBC doesn't control. So if I run a clip on my program of Boris Johnson, or if there's only a, one eyewitness to a bomb, you have to run that clip. You can't not. We won't count those people, but we'll count everyone else. And by that way, I thought people would see that data as fair. Next is it has to be simple. Journalists are very busy. They're under the cosh. If I turn up and say, ah, it's only going to take half an hour, we're not going to get very far into the conversation. So I decided on a system where if someone counted, they would count as one. So we don't measure time, we just measure the number of people in a program. You compromise a little bit on accuracy, what you get on return is that it takes about 90 seconds to count an hour of quite complex TV like my show. So that, suddenly that big reason not to do it, workload, you just completely remove it from the table with a system that's sufficiently simple that it doesn't get in the way. The next thing was credibility. I was aware that journalists, again, being quite skeptical, sometimes grumpy people, don't take too kindly to someone who's not from a newsroom walking in and saying, hey, why don't you do this? The argument is always, you don't necessarily understand what it's like. I was interested in the idea of, well, what about if the people making the case do know exactly what it's like? What about if it's me? What about if it's some of my colleagues making the case? So when I'm standing in front of a group of journalists and saying, would you consider this? And they start saying, yeah, but... What about this and what about that? I can say back to them, I go through all of this too. I'm with you. I'm one of you. And I was really interested in the idea that credibility could drive people's willingness to sign up. Next, we were going to talk about quality. For whether for good or for wrong, if you just lecture people and say increasing women's representation is the right thing to do, it doesn't work. Whether it should work or not, I don't know. But it doesn't work. What I was more interested in doing was saying there is a connection between the quality of your, between the diversity of your journalism and the quality. It comes back to the lesson I learned from my professor of history, telling me if you don't diversify your sources, you can't understand what you're talking about as well as you might do. And if the very reason I walk through the door at the BBC is because I believe in the importance of reporting and analysing the world fairly, if I'm not speaking to people who represent the world, I'm fundamentally hindering my ability to do that. And that's the language we talk about it. We're not turning up and lecturing anyone that you just really ought to do this. Next, and this is crucial, 
people feel very busy and they feel reluctant to take more on. So I made it voluntary. It's still voluntary. If people want to do it, they can opt in. If they don't want to do it, they don't do it. If they want to start it and stop it, that's fine. It completely removes that tension between, oh, management are forcing us to do this if management aren't forcing you to do it. Next, I wanted to make it positive because I've noticed with diversity, sometimes it can feel like someone comes in, they measure how, you, measure how you're doing, invariably it's not as well as you'd like to be doing, and that doesn't necessarily feel great. And so I wanted to turn that round and think about this as an opportunity, both a creative opportunity and an opportunity in terms of our service for our audience. And so we celebrate people who are doing well, we support people who are struggling. There is zero shaming, there is zero telling off, there is zero uh, crosswords at 50-50. It's just not like that at all. And lastly, and we'll get into the meat of it now, I needed proof, because I can't have a credible conversation without anyone saying we can do this unless I can prove it's possible, and I had no proof. So I set about doing that. I used to hear this a lot. We'd love to do it, but it's not possible. For that, I turned back to my sounding boards and the people who make stuff. I went and spoke to two of my most trusted colleagues, my editor and the then senior producer, and I said, could we trial this for a month, please? I then went to speak to the woman who set up the BBC's 100 Women, Fiona Crack, who takes no prisoners, and I'm a mate of hers, but she would tell me if I was doing something silly, and I said, look at this, does it hang together? Tell me if it does or not. And so we stress tested it, and I persuaded my team that we would trial it. And we all agreed on one rule, which was no compromise on quality. This is not a quota system, this is not about putting women on air for the sake of it, it's about finding more brilliant women, it's not about keeping brilliant men off air, if the best guest is a man, every time they go on. And this is what happened. So, in January 2017, we got a shot, we measured it, we were doing much worse than we thought, but my small team of four or five producers went from being ambivalent and a bit worried about workload to A, shocked, and B, highly motivated to fix it. And with no added resources, this started to happen. We went to 43%, we went to 46%, and by April of 2017, we'd reached 51, and we did it the week, the month after. And just in case you're wondering, last month we were 54%, which was our 24th consecutive month from 50% or more. So we proved that it was sustainable. And now I was thinking, okay, well, I proved it on my program, but how can I scale this? So I've got a system, I've got the proof. The next thing I want to roll in is the peer group dynamic. And to do that, I come to the fourth category, people with direct power. I went and started speaking to editors, assistant editors, senior producers, and saying, hey, I'm doing something, would you like to take part? Because without them saying yes, there would be nothing I could do. And five of them said yes. So in the summer, we expanded a little bit. And to my delight, their numbers started moving in the right direction. And then other people started joining up. By the end of December, we were close to 20 uh, teams. Um, and by February, we're up to 66 programs. And I'm still doing this on my own with the help of a couple of friends who are doing it on a voluntary basis as well. So by this point, we had, whoops, by this time we had a number of the BBC's biggest programs, and we had a significant amount of take up around BBC News, which was both surreal and exciting. And the crucial thing is you can't join 5050 unless you're willing to share your data. At the end of each month, I send everyone's numbers to everyone. So if you're doing well, everyone sees it. If you're not doing so well, everyone sees it. That is incredibly powerful. It increases motivation. It reduces the risk of stopping. No one wants to be seen to be dropping out in front of their peers. It helps to recruit new teams. And I can see a colleague here, a former colleague from Newsnight. Hello. When Newsnight came on board, other people are going, all oh, right, Newsnight's doing it. Maybe we'll come in as well. The peer group dynamic of, oh, they're doing it, maybe we should, is hugely important. But this is the most important. It created pride in something bigger. It felt good to be joining forces with teams, even teams we didn't have relationships with, to take on something that we knew we needed to take on. And so if I had the system, I had the proof, I had the peer group dynamic, the last bit of the jigsaw in my idea was I needed management endorsement. Not management instruction, not diktats, but I needed management to say, we know about this and we like it. And so I emailed the Director General's main advisor, a brilliant woman called Frances Wilde, and I said, can I come and see you please? And I did, and she was taken with it, and she said, come and see Tony Hall, and I did. And not very long later, Afterwards, he put just a couple of sentences in a speech that he made in February 2018. Just a couple of sentences. He didn't tell anyone to do it. But just that signal that he was aware of it and that he approved of it was incredibly powerful. I've heard this called a permission structure by people who study 
business models and so on. Um, it's not a phrase I'd known, but I know what they're getting at, in that it's a, you create a structure where you tell staff, you can do this, we would like you to do this, but you don't compel them to. So having uh, put it in a speech, two months later, Tony Hall announced what we called the 50-50 challenge. We announced publicly, in 12 months' time, we will come back to you April 2019, and we will tell you our numbers. We're going to publish the lot. That was a, a pretty big step for him to take. It ended up on the front page of The Telegraph, which was uh, the latest in a number of surreal developments, and it certainly focused our minds in terms of the commitments we were making. But look what it did to the size of the project. You can see, in the spring of 2018, we're around the 70-80 mark in terms of BBC content teams. By April 2019, we were on 500. The whole project had just gone whoosh, like that. We were outside of news. We were across every major uh, network the BBC has. We were in science programs, sport programs, natural history, entertainment, children's. The list goes on and on. And we'd also built up that idea of the peer group dynamic. We'd built a tool, an internal dashboard, where everyone had to enter their numbers, because frankly, it was getting quite laborious for me to put them all in the spreadsheet. Uh, but it also means that anyone in the BBC at any point can go and see how any team doing 50-50 is doing. You can compare one team versus another. You can see how news is doing versus sport. You can go and see how the science programs are doing. The numbers were there for everyone to see. And at this point, I would emphasize this crucial point, that the data we're collecting is the engine for changing how we behave. It's not the goal. Previous diversity initiatives I'd seen were so focused on the data, they forgot to make sure the data actually was having an impact. I'm entirely focused on the impact with the data helping me to get there. So we tell teams, when you've made a program, before any false narratives about how well you're doing or how well you're not being settled in, share the data there and then. The amount of times we come off air and we say, we had lots of women in today's program, and then it turns out we had 42% women, because if you're used to seeing news with 35% women, 42% feels like a lot, but it's not a lot. Um, we share data monthly across the whole project. Everyone sees how everyone's doing. We target the data. So we now have so much data. If I send all the data to the head of news, Fran Unsworth, she, with all due respect, she's probably not going to want to read in detail the sport data or the natural history data. So we send her just the news data because that's the data that's relevant to her. So we target the data. And lastly, we emphasize again and again the data's potency diminishes exponentially. With every minute that goes by, its potency reduces. The quicker you use the data, the more high impact it will be on people's behavior. And so we're working and working and working, and we're approaching April 2019, and you know, it was fun, but it uh, you know, led me to have a couple of uh, sleepless nights. Um, and this is how we did, and it kind of exceeded all of my expectations. So for teams doing the project for 12 months or more, only 27% of them started on 50% women. In April, 74% uh, reached 50% women. We also reduced the number of teams producing content with below 40% women to 8% from 41%. So these aren't just small shifts. These are enormous shifts uh, in, uh, in a newsroom which has been taking on this issue for a long time. Across the whole project, so these are teams who may have only been doing it for a month or two, the shift was still enormous, from 26% to 57%. And then perhaps most remarkable of all, BBC World Service, which broadcasts in around 40 languages, and which initially was a bit reticent, they felt like there may be some cultural obstacles to making progress, also delivered remarkable results. Only 17% of their content teams reached 50% women when they started, 61% made it in April. And these are just some examples, I could give you lots more of the kind of shifts that we saw across some of the BBC's most high-profile programming. And I would highlight uh, BBC Arabic's flagship news program, News Hour. We had this lovely, lovely message from the head of BBC Arabic after April saying, for, for years we've been telling ourselves that these women didn't exist and we just had to look for them. And it was like, oh my goodness, he's going to make me wobble here. And it was just a lovely moment where we'd shown that things we'd told ourselves weren't possible, it turned out they were. In the report we published, uh, Tony also said 50-50s transformed our approach to representation, which was another uh, real moment for us. And if that was part of my grand plan, I, I still had a bit more of a grand plan, because the whole idea was, if you generate proof, you can inspire others to do what you're doing. But if you inspire others to do what you're doing, that doesn't just support them, it actually locks you in emotionally to what you're doing more. 
So as 5050 has grown, my team, the, the outside source team, we feel a responsibility to keep this going. We started this thing. And so you both support the next person taking it on and you support yourself. And so outside source had done it, it had spread to BBC News. BBC News had done it, it spread across the BBC. And if the BBC is doing it, perhaps we could jump it outside the BBC. So I asked the head of the BBC, can we offer this around? And he said, of course, go for it. And remarkably, people started saying yes. So now we have some of the biggest brands in global media, Fortune, FT, New York Public Media, ABC Australia, Wiley in Finland, uh, YFM's a big music station in South Africa, Voice of America, MSNBC, FIPS, the biggest magazine publishers in the world. That uh, was a publishing group, I should say, rather than the publisher in itself. Standard Group's one of the biggest media groups in East Africa. We've now moved into academia with a number of universities starting to work with their students on this. And we've received lots of very positive feedback. This came in from TV New Zealand the other day. Female representation has very much become part of our conversation. The team has changed its thinking. We think this is pretty amazing, given we've only been taking part since June 2019. And we think it's exciting too. And I've pulled out two more quotes. And these for me are really, really important. Uh, this one's from a uh, senior figure at Wiley in Finland. 50 years, 50 years changed the way we think. Vivian Schiller is a very, very senior media exec in the US. She's held any number of posts. She called it a grade A case study in culture change. And the reason I picked these two out is because you'll have noticed I'm not talking to you about which stories you choose or how you should do your journalism or how you should go about your reporting or any of those things. I don't need to give journalists lessons in being tenacious, in being creative, in producing brilliant content. I wouldn't dream of offering any advice on that. They do it well enough already. What 5050 is about is about sensitization and about motivation because my theory is if you can put on that list of things we expect of ourselves, getting the best guests, getting the best stories, doing the best production standard, being balanced, if you can put representing women on that same list, the rest will follow. So this, for me, is really rewarding because that's what I'm looking for, to change how people think about this issue. I'm not telling them in detail how to fix it. I think they'll do that themselves. Just a couple of other things to mention. Uh, a lot of what I've talked to you about is uh, demand. Journalists go out into the world and they say, we would like contributions or sources or quotes or guests from organizations or governments or, or whatever it might be. And then we are offered possibilities on that front. And actually, most of my project had been focused on demand. But actually, one of the team came back to me, because we now have a small number of people working on 5050, came back and said, well, why don't we look at this from the other side? Why don't we look at it from the supply side? If you're working with the people pushing sources into the media, that would make our life a lot easier. So we approached Edelman, one of the biggest PR firms in the world, and Edelman has now got us working with some of their most high profile clients to measure who they are putting into the media. I would love to be able to name a couple of them, we're not quite at that stage, but some of the biggest multinational brands in the world are now applying this methodology so they know that what they are pushing out is also going to be fairly balanced, which of course in turn makes the media's job a lot easier. All of which adds up to uh, around four so kind of movable fees, but I think 549 BBC content teams, over 6,000 BBC staff, 44 external partners, and we're operating in these countries as well. All of which generates quite a lot of interest. The Washington Post has covered it. The Neiman Lab guys have covered it. The Pointer Institute has covered it. Perhaps most unlikely of all, an article in the Harvard Business Review was published recently about what we've done. And to my delight, Harvard Kennedy School and London Business School are now producing a case study on how this works. And had a very surreal moment a couple of weeks ago watching Siri Chalazi from Harvard Kennedy School teaching the business case to a bunch of uh, US media execs in New York, organized by the Ford Foundation, and there was no one from 5050 or the BBC there. <laughs> it's kind of taken on, a, taken on a life of its own, which has been a, a huge thrill. And, and what Siri was saying was that apparently 5050 follows the East framework, which is easy, attractive, social, and timely, which I'd never heard of until two weeks ago, but I think it's a reasonable description of what we've managed to do. In terms of what we're doing next, well, we're committing again to publishing our data. March will be the next 50-50 month, and in April we'll produce a report where, whether we do well, whether we do badly, whether we do in the middle, all of our data will be pushed out there. And the data continues to do the work that I wanted it to do, which is to motivate us, to inspire us, and to guide us. But it isn't just about the data, it's how we use the data as well, and of course we're still very much focused on that. 
So that is where we've got to. We have a team of two and many, many hundreds of PBC, people at the BBC who work on it simply because they believe in it and it continues to morph in, in lots of different directions. I don't want to give the impression that we've packed this or that this is the only way to go about this issue or that in some ways the problem is solved because it most definitely isn't. But it feels exciting to be taking on something which I think a lot of us at the BBC have been aware of for many years but perhaps weren't quite sure how to, to go forward with it. And this seems to be a way of going forward that is delivering some results. Thank you very much.